right, well, hello, everybody. How's it going? If you notice the um, sad state in which I just lived in, um, it's because I wiped out in front of the entire bookstore in New Orleans last night in the street, um, right down into the gravel. Um, so my knee was literally just examined by a doctor. It's like, yeah. good luck, God be with you. <laughs> so if I'm like reclining like this, um, it's not just because I'm like super chill. <laughs> I'm also in like super pain. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> here's, here's the mic. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's get started then. Um, we're gonna uh, start out with a 20 minute Q&A between Sarah and myself, and then we're gonna jump into an audience Q&A, which will also take place over a 20 minute time span. And um, then after that, we will be jumping into the signing. So first off, why don't you introduce A Court of Thorns and Roses and what we can expect from this new series. Um, so A Court of Thorns and Roses is the longest title of all time. <laughs> So we call it Akatar. Um, like literally, like everyone, in, like my publisher, my family is just Akatar. Um, so Akatar was a story that I began writing in 2009. Um, and in 2009, I had been out of college for a year. Um, and some of you might remember that in 2008, uh, the economy completely imploded and being a creative writing major with no work experience. Um, fast forward a year, I still did not have a job. Um, little like story about me. <laughs> I applied to jobs at like three Barnes and Nobles. I didn't get a single interview. <laughs> now the tables have turned. <laughs> Me now, um, my busted leg. Um, but so after a year of being out of school, I still didn't have a job. Um, but I did have an agent for throwing a class, um, and my agent and I had done actually a couple rounds of position on throwing a glass to get it ready to go out to editors at publishing houses. Um, and I was like ready to go to send it out there and like maybe get a book deal and like not have like so many problems and so much drama. Um, but then my agent called me and she was like, so I'm pregnant, I'm going on maternity leave, so just sit tight for a couple months and then we'll, you know, when I come back, we'll send through a class to publishers and see what happens. Um, and I am like a profoundly lazy person, like in every aspect of my life. Like if I am left to my own devices, I will be like unshowered for five days, lying on the couch with like that sad little Netflix message of like, are you still watching? Um, it's like, yes, I am so lazy, I can't even like hit the like fast forward button. Um, I am really, really lazy about everything, um, except for writing. Uh, writing's the one thing that I've always been like, weirdly obsessively focused about. Um, I began writing for a glass when I was 16 and I treated it as a job and not in like the soul sucking like nine to five cents but in like the sense that I showed up, I worked on it, I wanted to be published and that was my goal and that was what I worked for. Um, I wrote on weekends, on summer vacations, I wrote before, after, and instead of homework. Um, <laughs> stay in school and work hard. <laughs> um, and so, you know, writing stuff, um, I'm a bit of a workaholic, so when my agent was like, sit tight for like four months, I was like, well crap, like I'm gonna go crazy if I do nothing. Um, and at that point, like I didn't know if I would ever get published. Um, and out of the blue one day, I was listening to the Princess Mononoke soundtrack, the Miyazaki films, um, and I was listening to just a random piece of music, and out of nowhere I had this, um, scene play out in my mind where this young huntress is stalking through a snowy wood um, and she is looking for game to, to bring home to her family who's starving and she knows that if she comes home with nothing uh, she might very well die and her family might die um, and I heard this heroine's voice as clearly in my head as the music I was listening to um, and I just started asking myself questions after that um, I've always loved fairy tales. Like, I like was like a weird, very like weirdly like magically obsessed child. My parents love to read, but they're very like intellectual people. Like, 
literary fiction and like nonfiction and like I was the changeling that was like, was, like unicorns and elves I want the cons please and they're like all right like as long as you're reading like whatever um, and so I had grown up with like a steady diet of just like fairy tale everything and once I started asking myself these questions about you know who was this young huntress um, you know like, why was her family so poor um, I thought, you know, like, it's kind of like the original Beauty and the Beast retelling, and I always wanted to do a fairy tale retelling, and I thought, you know, like, it could be, like, the original Beauty and the Beast folk folklore legend, where um, Beauty's family is actually a merchant class family that fell into poverty, um, and I thought, oh, like, this could be my chance to do, like, a Beauty and the Beast retelling, and why not pull in some other fairy tales that I really liked. Um, and usually when I get, like, story ideas, I let them sit on the back burner for, like, weeks and months and years, um, but with Akatar, like, I just instantly started writing, um, and that first chapter just poured out of me, and the first chapter in Akatar is actually pretty much that scene, the way it played out in my head, um, almost word for word, which is really rare for me, because usually, like, my first drafts are, like, total crap, so, like, everything gets rewritten, like, a million times, but that scene's pretty much untouched from its original, you know, first few words that I wrote in 2009. Um, and I wound up writing the first draft in about five weeks, which is like really fast for me. It was around like 100,000 words. Um, now it's like 130,000 words. This like book kept like growing with like every round. Um, my editor's always like, can't you like write like a short book? <laughs> <laughs> no, like I'll try. <laughs> I'm like, here's 180,000 word Queen of Shadows. Queen of Shadows was 211,000 words in the first draft. I got it down a little bit. My editor's like, I am going to have an anxiety attack. <laughs> um, so I wrote the first draft of Akatar in five weeks, and then I just put it in you know, the proverbial drawer on my computer and let it sit there for years. Um, my agent came back from having her baby, um, and we sent Verna Glass out to editors, and it sold. Um, and then all this awesome stuff started happening with the Verna Glass books. Um, and because the Verna Glass series is like 10 bajillion books long, like the final book will be out in like the year 3065. <laughs> it will be the series that never ends. Um, I thought, you know, like I have all these stories that I've already like written and that I love just like sitting on my computer and like I want to share them like now. Like I don't want to have to wait until like one series is done. And because I'm like a workaholic with all my writing stuff, I was like, all right, why don't we try out like two books a year? See what happens. LOL. <laughs> I have no life. <laughs> my life is deadline. Um, but it's good because writing is what I always wanted to do, so I get to actually do my dream job. Um, but so we wound up selling Akatar to my publisher, um, and I picked Akatar out of all my story ideas because over those years that it was just sitting on my computer, I kept coming back to it and reading the manuscript for fun, um, just because I love the characters and the world. Um, so it's actually like really awesome to see Akatar now as like a real book um, and look at it and see my name with that like fancy little like. New York Times bestseller <laughs> tag on it and know that, you know, like when I wrote that book, like I had no idea what was going to happen to me. Like I was very much like my heroine, like in a snowy wood, like not knowing if I would make it or like if any of my dreams would happen. And so now that I get to like be on a like 20 city international <laughs> book tour for that, like that's insane. Um, so it feels actually a lot like a fairy tale of my own. Um, and now I'm getting really sappy. <laughs> now I'm gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry. I've cried at like events before and that is like mortifying. So I'm holding it in. I already like pity cried for my knee in the shower earlier <laughs> today. Okay, you guys were worried. I was so sad. I was like washing my hair. <laughs> it hurts, it hurts. And I was like, get your shit together, Sarah. I'm a professional. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a heavy presence of fairies in the Throne of Glass series and then again in the Court of Thorns and Roses. So what made you want to write about fairies and what's the hardest thing about writing them? Um, so I have the, the fae in both of my series um, and I feel like they come from my like obsession with elves. But like elves are kind of like passe now. Um, in high school I was obsessed obsessed with Lord of the Rings. Like, you guys don't understand. I was the president and founder 
of the Lord of the Rings Club in high school, <laughs> um, which would explain why I did not have one date in high school. <laughs> I'm not even joking, like not one. Um, I would get up at like assembly and be like, the Lord of the Rings Club was meeting at one o'clock today in case anyone would like to join us. Um, no one ever wanted to join us. It was like me and my two friends and like the freshmen that we like terrorized into joining us. Like, I don't want to be here, but I'm scared to move. <laughs> and this was like before the days of like YouTube or anything. So like we would just go on like the New Line Cinema like website and watch the trailers like every every week. Um, I still have like life-size cardboard standees of Eowyn and Frodo and Legolas. Um, I had them in high school. Legolas was my boyfriend, actually. <laughs> like, I would, like, kiss him. Yeah, like, like, sticks he does. Like, like yeah. they're, like, oil imprints now. It's so nasty. Um, but, but, like, he stayed in my parents' house for years, and finally my mom was like, these are yours. I'm going to burn them if you don't take them. So I finally brought them to my house, and Legolas is now in my office. Um, he and my husband have, like, this rivalry going on. Or, like, I'll come into my office randomly, and, like, my husband will, like, put, like, a tie on Legolas. It's like, you know, like, when your cat's mad and, like, they leave, like, presents around the house. It's like, what will my husband do with Legolas today? He's, like, weirdly threatened by Legolas. Um, when I left, I might have, like, touched, like, Legolas's face and been like, I'll see you in a couple weeks. <laughs> so I've had this, like, you know, like, obsession with, like, pointy-eared men. <laughs> and when I was doing the Thorn of Glass books, I was like, I don't want to have, like, elves, like the Tolkien style, but I want, you know, something similar where there are these immortal creatures, but they're also, like, way more, like, primal and, like, dominant. And I'm a huge fan of, like, romance and, like, adult paranormal romance. My, my fae are, you know, more one with nature. Um, and then with Akatar, it was just kind of like a coincidence. I wasn't like, I need extra fae. <laughs> I just was... Um, when I did the Beauty and the Beast retelling element, um, I knew that I wanted there to be romance in Akatar, um, and I wanted there to be like steamy times, lots of steamy times. Um, but obviously, if like he was in his beast form, um, that would be a different kind of book <laughs> and a different part of the library. Um, and so I thought, right, if I want the romance, how can I get around it? Um, and I thought, whoa. Well, why not make him a shape-shifting, like, super hot, normally shirtless fairy lord? Um, and so he can, like, you know, shift into his beast form when he needs to go, like, slay. Um, but then, like, he can be, like, a dude and, like, have the sexy times on <laughs> all, other, all other occasions. Um, and so it was just kind of like a, you know, coincidence that I wound up with two series with the fae, with fae in them, and they're both pretty different, but there are some similarities. I like to think of, like, my various series as existing in like a megaverse where like if you were to open like a word gate in the Thorn of Glass world like you could walk into the Akatar world and there might be creatures in both worlds that have like crossed over when the gates were open for a little bit. Um, I'm like such a nerd. I like write like fanfic of like my own. <laughs> and like my best friend um, who's a YA author named Susan Dennard where it's like yeah all our worlds exist together. Like if a character dies like then they go to like the other person's world and like get reincarnated as another character or they're just like chilling in like a heaven realm together. Um, we have like actual fanfic of our own characters meeting. We're so weird. Can we read it? Um, no because a lot of it is like self insert and like sad and yeah. weird. You, know, like, you have, like two beautiful girls named like Farah and like Dusan. Like all the men love them because they're so powerful and blonde. <laughs> oh man, I, I am like a weird lame person. Why well, I'm not like public. How dare you? <laughs> we were at an event in like Nashville and someone's phone went off and this was like LOL or whatever and like a woman got like so pissed in the crowd that she like flipped the woman off like, in like all seriousness and I was just like what's happening with like, Nashville I don't understand you and I was just like cool I was like I'm gonna pretend I didn't see that we're gonna move on so it's cool thank <laughs> you all right if uh, Selena were to be in uh, Court of Thorns and Roses what court do you think she would be a part of also, what court would you be a part of? Oh. 
I'd be part of like the sedentary court, the lazy court. It's a, court. <laughs> it's a small court. It's on like a little island where there's no sunshine because I hate sunshine. Uh, it's always cloudy and rainy. Um, it's kind of like the, you know, the Care Bear, like grumpy. It's like, like where he would live and I would live. We don't like nice things. Um, <laughs> Selena would probably. This is so spoilery. I'm working on book two right now, Avatar. You get to see more of the Night Court, which is like my favorite, and I think Selena will be like into that. It's so hard to talk about it. Oh my God, so many secrets inside of me. <laughs> Tell us your secrets. <laughs> like, I, I would hate the summer court because I hate hot weather. Yeah. Spring court, well, maybe spring court. Tamlin would be there, shirtless. <laughs> and like there's like buried weather and the autumn, autumn is my favorite season, um, but they are like conniving awful people. So I just be like, it's beautiful, but I'm scared to death. <laughs> so I don't know. There's no, I won't, I'll be on Grumpy Island off, off the coast of Prithian. <laughs> All right, if Feyre and Selena were to switch roles, if Feyre were to be in Throne of Glass and Selena in A Court of Thorns and Roses, how do you think they would do switching roles? <laughs> oh my god, Selena would like, I don't like, she would eat the men in Akatar alive. Like, they just like, wouldn't know what to do with her. Um, like, that would be a bloodbath. Feyre, I think, would like actually like get along Kale. Someone asked me like who I would ship Feyre with in the Throne of Glass world, and I think like Feyre and Kale would be like, oh my ship. And so now I'm gonna go home and write fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> so I think like Feyre needs someone that's like loyal and like solid, um, and I think Kale would be that. For her. I think she'd be terrified of her. Like Dorian's like too much of like a playboy. She's like you're ridiculous. And I'm like mm, no. And then I think Rowan would like scare her to death. Um, and Selena, I don't know. She, I would pay good money to see her and Reese go head to head. I think they would, they might kill each other. Um, I think actually Selena and Tamlin would kill each other. Um, literally murder. Like if that would be. I would pay money to see that. I would pay money to see all of this actually. So if someone like animate this, make this into a thing that I can, I can see. Um, it wouldn't go well. Either. Actually, favorite I think would be like all right. She's pretty like adaptable. Yeah. Whereas like Selena would burn everything to the ground. <laughs> like, Screw these stupid courts. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, if Kale and Dorian were Faye, what would their transformation be? These are the best questions I've ever been asked. Oh my God. Um. Hmm. I feel like. Dorian with, you know, rolling hair. Like, what's the sexiest animal? <laughs> you would. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? My psychic energy is <laughs> psychic. Um, I feel like Dorian would be like a panther. Like a black panther. <laughs> like a sexy cat thing. Like a black panther. Whatever. I don't know. Um, Kale would be... Something that's like, I want to be like a golden retriever, but that's just so lame. Like, Kale's way hotter than a golden retriever. But like, he's not like a wolf either. Adian's a wolf. Um, hmm. Great. Kale will be a greyhound. <laughs> that's the worst. <laughs> the most undignified looking dog. I love them. They're the sweetest dogs. Um, maybe like an, maybe like an Irish. Scottish Wolfhound or a big shaggy dog, majestic. So like, think whatever the hot like a hot animal is, Kale would be that. <laughs> like a hot solid animal. <laughs> I need to think on this, but definitely Panther for Dorian. Sleek, nice coat, very soft, fuzzy. <laughs>
five different majors, like constantly undecided. And she'd be like, I want to be a painter, and now I want to be a writer. Um, now I want to be a dancer. She'd probably be like English major um, with like a minor in like music, maybe. She like wouldn't be able to decide her minor. Um, Aira, Aira would be an art major. <laughs> Tamlin would be like, like wildlife management. <laughs> It'd be like the Hagrid. <laughs> um, Reese would be like political science, probably. And so would Lucian, probably. Those conniving bastards. <laughs> and Rowan, Rowan would be in like Tamlin's like Hagrid program. The Hagrid Institute. They'd be on like, like the other side of campus. Like they would have their own special like stone hut. <laughs> they'd both be shirtless. <laughs> it's more fanfic, I'm gonna write. <laughs> Alright, we're gonna start taking audience questions now, so if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Hey, Anybody? Have a question? You can literally ask. Oh, oh, please wow. have a question. <laughs> you. Um, okay. You said any question, so what's your favorite color? <laughs> My favorite color? Red. Actually. But like. I love red, it's like everything that I don't want it, like in my house. Like, I don't want too much red, so I, like all my accessories are red. Red purse, red headphones. It's probably why Selena has like fire. I have, I'm not like a pyromaniac, but like, I do like red. Thank you for that question. Someone ever asked me that, and I always wish people would. Not that anyone needs to know my color preference. Other on a scale of 1 to 10, how scared should we be of Queen of Darkness? Or Queen of Shadows. Shadows. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Kidding, kidding. Um, you should be at like a 1,000 level of fear. <laughs> I know everything and you know nothing about this book and it's so awesome to be able to talk about. The worst. Um, I cried a lot while writing this book, but happy moments and sad moments. There are a lot of like reunions between characters that made me cry. Um, and there are lots of action sequences that I was like so amped to write, I like couldn't stay in my seat. Um, Selena and Manon will be meeting in this book. I said that online, I was in person. Um, and that meeting goes as well as you can expect. <laughs> two of them to go. That scene, I was like, I couldn't keep my ass in the chair. I was just like, oh my god, holy shit, this is happening. It's happening. They're meeting. Like, I was like, fan girl, like, my own character was so lame. Um, and there are some steamy times in the book that I was excited to write. Um, and I don't know, it was probably the most fun I've ever had writing a book. Um, Air of Fire was like, my migraine book because I cried so much constantly while writing that book. Um, that like I had to like make myself like really like emotionally vulnerable to get into Selena's head. Um, cashier to cash wrap please. Cashier to cash wrap. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm here. Some people just don't follow instructions. <laughs> Never coming back here ever again. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding, but I'm not. <laughs> um, but with Queen of Shadows, I just, you know, Aelin slash Selena, sorry that's a spoiler, she's now like healed and she is ready to kick some ass and get vengeance for some things that happened in the novellas, if you guys have read those. Um, she's basically come back to the Empire to bury the two men who wrecked her life. Um, one of them being Aroban, her master, and the other one being, you know, this like random little man called the king. <laughs> um, so she is uh, out for vengeance, and it is probably all, well, yeah, the most fun I've ever had writing a book, but there were tears, and you should be scared. You should be really scared. You should already be running out in fear. <laughs> um, what was the hardest book to write out of the ones that are out now? Um, the question was, what was the hardest book to write? Air of Fire, definitely. I mean, that one, um, this is a spoiler for Crown of Midnight, so if you don't want to be spoiled, you've been warned. Three, two, one, I hope your ears are plugged. Your ears are plugged, all right. Um, 
we'll tell you. Yes, <laughs> safe. Oh, no, you can just be spoiled. Um, so at the end of Crowd of Midnight, uh, Selena's lost her best friend, Nehemia. And so Air of Fire was kind of about the consequences of that. Um, and in order to get into her head, I had to kind of imagine a world in which my best friend, Susan Dennard, didn't exist. And I can, I can barely even talk about this without, like, you know, getting upset. Um, but, like, getting into that, like, emotional state of, you know, absolute despair and misery was really exhausting um, and hard. Um, and every time I had to open up that book, I had to go through that entire um, journey again. Um, an air of fire required me to, you know, be way more vulnerable um, and go into like my own experiences and feelings um, more than I ever did in another book. Um, I like to say that like when I'm drafting a book, I vomit like on the page. I just like literally like, people are like, "What's your process like?" And I'm like, "Oh, I just you know literally vomit the plot onto the page and <laughs> on the screen." Um, but with Air of Fire, I like basically bled on the page. Um, and so that book was the hardest book I've had to write um, emotionally because it took so much out of me. Um, and that book was also at its heart about like friendship, not just you know like Aelin and Rowan, but then Manon and Abraxos and Dorian and Kale. And, um, and so it means a lot. That back, that book probably means the most to me out of any. Um, cause I think like friendship is as powerful as you know, true romantic love, and I think friendship can save you and heal parts of you you didn't know were broken um, and change your life. Um, that's kind of what my best friend Susan did for me. So that there's a reason why I like that book is dedicated to her, even though I dedicated Crown of Midnight to her. <laughs> my parents are like, so like, when are we going to to us? Sorry, every book needs to be dedicated to Susan, and so you get to be in the acknowledgments of that. It's really like kind of embarrassing. Like I would dedicate every book to Susan if I could. I'm like, I should probably like spread the wealth a little bit. Can you put some of your characters in Hogwarts houses? Okay. Can I, can I sort my characters into Hogwarts houses? Dorian is definitely Ravenclaw. Um, Nehemia was Ravenclaw. Kale is like Hufflepuff, and I mean that in like the sexy Cedric Diggory way. <laughs> like, where you, like, you, like, for like most of Harry Potter, you're like, oh, Hufflepuff's so lame, and then Cedric comes along, and you're like, is it lame? Like, they've got like hottie number one. Um, so he would be the Cedric of Hufflepuff. Because um, they're like, you know, like loyal and like good. Right? Hufflepuffs are like the unsung hero of Harry Potter. Um, Selena would be, yeah, um, Selena would totally be like one of those like cusp people, or she would like she could be in Slytherin, but like she's probably actually a Gryffindor. Um, Rowan Gryffindor. Um, Feyre would be Feyre would probably be Slytherin actually. Reese is Slytherin. Hamlin's Gryffindor. Are these? Am I ruining? Like, did you have like? Or did you sort them into houses? Am I like totally out the mark? Of what you no, you're like you're speaking my praises. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm Gryffindor completes my life. Like, uh, we share a house. Well, know? I feel like the sorting hat would be like. You're a bad person sometimes, so you could be Slytherin, <laughs> Selena. But you can also do good things, so it's up to you. And she'd be like, oh, like the Gryffindors probably throw better parties. So. <laughs> 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 Okay, I know you've mentioned before in other interviews that you're thinking about maybe doing a novella for Knox, but will we ever see him as well <coughs> as um, Ansel and the Silent Assassins and the Pirate Captain in the actual Throne of Glass series again, besides just like an honorable mention in Air of Fire? Yeah, um, so I'm working on, I'm drafting the fifth Throne of Glass book right now, and maybe this is spoilery, but Rolf, the Pirate Lord, boyfriend is in it. Um, I have plans to bring Ansel back. Maybe in book five. It's already like really effing long and I'm just like, when is this be gonna show up? <laughs> it would be good if she could show up like sooner or before it gets to be like, you know, 300,000 words. Um, so that they are definitely coming back and Knox boyfriend has been up to some stuff too. Um, 
vibe. Like he, right now he is in those five. Like he just like makes an appearance because I just was like, and we need more hot men. <laughs> so he does come back, but like writing first drafts, like I say things happen and then it might not happen. But I have plenty, like everything in the novellas was intentional. Um, and my goal is to bring like a lot of those characters and things back. Um, so at some point, we'll see. This is why this will be the series that never ends. So I'm like, <laughs> these books have to be like a slightly reasonable length, but there's a lot, a lot to pack in. Okay, let's go with one more question, okay? Uh, let's go with you. Um, do you see parts of yourself in your characters? Like, do you share qualities with them? Um, anytime Selena's eating, <laughs> <laughs> usually because I am eating. Uh, I'm like, what could be going on in the scene? I'm like, mm, I'm stopping my face. No, why? <laughs> Selena should be eating. That's like an action. Um, but like emotionally, um, it's like kind of like spoilery, but you find out more about these characters in Queen of Shadows with Aster and Blackbeak, um, Anon's second in command. You learn a bit of, about her in Queen of Shadows. Um, she's like a kindred spirit. I didn't like give her parts to me, but like while I was writing it, I was like, like a weird bond with you and then um like sandra from the novellas who's, she was not nice in the novellas um but she comes back into me in the shadows and uh, who she winds up being in the book uh, she's probably the most like me but none of my characters like i actually don't like self-insert for all my self-insert fanfic i don't <laughs> self-insert myself um in into the books but i'd say like every you know in order to write any of my characters i have to like give up some part of me, you know, I wish I was like as cool as Lena, I wish I could you know, have assassin skills, nunchuck skills, assassin <laughs> skills, only if I know anyone, no, yeah. <laughs> really that movie is really passe now, um, yeah, that's my amazing answer to your question, are we, I have a quick announcement before we proceed. So, can you hold the microphone yeah. for me? Yeah. I can use both of my hands. So, at every event that I've gone to since Thorn of Glass has come out, all over the world, I've had readers sign my copy of Thorn of Glass. Um, so, if you guys are willing, um, I would love for you to sign my copy when you come up here. Um, I do take your name and sell it the devil when you write it in my magic book um but it means a lot to me when you know you guys sign this and when i when i have bad days i do open up this book and read it so write something nice <laughs> you know, like, be like you're so weird and awful um but yeah this if my house was burning this is like the one thing that i would grab like if my dog and husband were okay in that order like is the dog okay yes husband mm. um, but this book yeah it means a lot to me so i'd love it if you could sign it and if you guys didn't get your questions answered like i'm always happy to answer them when you come up here so and any random ones you have seen me now you know how weird I am, so you can ask me whatever you want. And thanks for coming, you guys, on Mother's Day. You're awesome.